I would like your help. Uh, we all, together as a church, want to listen to our Lord and, and share what we feel like He's teaching us and telling us and that kind of stuff. And so I've been picking the messages and, and I just thought that I would ask you to ask the Lord to help me with that in my next series. And so I've got this little orange sheet. It's in the bulletin. And I've sort of narrowed it down to about, what is it, four different sermon series. And if you would pray during the service and say, what, what sermon series would, would best help me? Would best help our church? Then collectively we can listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and perhaps pick a good sermon series to go forward. I won't always do that, but I just sort of felt led to do it this time. So all you need to do is circle your choice, and then when it comes to the offering time, go ahead and just drop it in the offering plate along with whatever tithe or offering God leads your heart to do it. Would you do that with me? All right. If you don't have any idea, then don't mess with it, all right? Or else you can write on the back, these all stink, Ron, here's a much better idea. And that'd be fine, too. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father God, we come before you today asking that you would give us a, a spirit of delight in you and in each other. You are the perfect one and you are perfecting us. Not as fast as we would like because we drag our heels spiritually, probably not as fast as you would prefer. But Lord, we just pray that you'll just uh, make us pliable like clay. And we'll allow you to do a perfect work in our lives, making us ever more and more like you. And Lord, just like you treasure us with all of our struggles and our faults, help us to treasure one another. You are long-suffering. May we be long-suffering too, with each other, with ourselves. Just keep growing us, Lord. And I pray that you help us today as we understand a very key uh, understanding of what it's like to have assurance of our salvation. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, I was, uh, after my first year of seminary, I went to Gull Lake Bible Conference. And I spent a summer there working with the youth program. And I had a phenomenal time and made a lot of good friends, one of whom was Ronnie Howard. Anybody know who Ronnie Howard is? Used to be Opie? Yeah, that guy. He's the same age as I am in real life. Uh, this wasn't the real Ronnie Howard. This was a Ronnie Howard look-alike. Every time I saw him, it just cracked me on up because he looked so much like Ronnie Howard. I don't even remember his real name anymore. When I think of it, I think, yeah, I had a great summer with Ronnie Howard. But one day, at the end of the summer, Ronnie pulled me aside. I'll keep calling him Ronnie. And, and he, he just was just downhearted. And he says, Ron, I hate to tell anybody this, but I don't know if I'm saved. Uh, I, I have struggled with this and all summer long. All these different Bible conference speakers that have come on in, I've been going to them one at a time and asking them about this. Because I feel like I've done everything that Scripture says I should do, but I just don't feel saved. And as a result, I keep praying and asking Jesus into my heart, and it just doesn't seem to make a difference. And it's, it's, just, it's, it's just killing me, Ron. And I understood what he was going through. Because this Ron had gone through the very same struggle, one of the most difficult struggles of my spiritual life. Last week, we talked about dealing with the intellectual doubts that you have. But I'm not quite talking about that. I'm talking more about the emotional doubts. And, and I grew up always wondering, am I really a Christian? So every time the invitation was given in church and pastors pastor say, pray this prayer after me, I'd pray it over again. Just to make sure. Because I wasn't sure that I was saved. And this just became a very difficult, painful experience. That fear, that fear that I've missed it. That fear that I wasn't going to heaven if I died. That, that fear that, uh, that I'm just going through the motions that I really don't know God. It was just an incredible, painful, painful thing. 
And finally, God led me on a real search for Scripture as I became a, a little bit more mature as a teenager to work this out scripturally. And it gave me a great peace. And when I explained it all to Ronnie Howard, it really helped him. Through the years, I've discovered that this is like one of the most secret, common struggles that Christians have. And they hardly ever tell others about it. And you may have struggled with it, or maybe you are. And so I would sort of like to deal with this. Many people go through their lives with occasional doubts as to whether they're genuine children of God. The Apostle John knew this. And as a result, he wrote the book of 1 John to help us uh, answer that question. And so in verse 4, he says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, he doesn't say so that you may hope that you've got eternal life. What did he say? So that you may know that you've got eternal life. And so in order for you to become a no-so Christian, he provides two very critical tests that you can take to sort of look at your doubts and put them to the test. You see, it is quite possible your doubts are valid. You're not really a Christian. One of the scariest parts in all of Scripture is that passage where Jesus Christ is talking, and he says, on that day, that day of judgment, many are going to come to me, and they're going to say, but Lord, Lord, I did this in your name, and I did that in your name, and I'm going to have to say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Isn't that awful? The thought that many people think they're saved and they're not? Well, the opposite problem is there are many people that are saved but aren't sure that they are. And both of those are very critical, so we need to put our doubts to the test. And he gives us two very important tests to take. And if you pass those tests, you can know your doubts are illegitimate and they can be discarded. Since it's often easier said than done, he shows you, first of all, how do you put your hearts, hearts to the test? How do you put your doubts to the test? And then afterwards, he shows you, now, now that you've done that, here is how you can take your hearts and make them at rest. So look at that first part. How to put your doubts to the test. Two tests. Number one, do you believe in Jesus? This is the path to a changed life. 1 John 5, 1 says this, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. What's God's promise? You believe in Jesus and you are what? Born again. Uh, chapter 3, verse 23. And this is his command to believe in the name of his Son. Chapter 4, verse 15. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. If you go to John's earlier letter, letter the Gospel of John, in John chapter 1, verse 12, he writes, Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So the Bible makes it very clear that if we will put our faith in Jesus, believing that he indeed is God himself, he's the Son of God, he's God the Son, that he is the Savior, and you put your trust and your faith in him, God promises you that you are born into his family. You're born again, you're converted, you've got new life. You're his. You're his forever. But this was my problem. I says, okay, I got that. But how do I know if I've got enough faith? You say, believe. Do I believe enough? What if I've got some doubts? What if I've got a bad faith? Folks, we need to come to the point where we don't put our faith in our faith. We put our faith in the Savior. Now let me give you an illustration. I grew up on a piece of property where my dad had put an artificial pond in it. And it's a pretty good-sized pond because my dad didn't do anything small. And 
when it came winter time, I remember as a kid wanting to go out and ice skate on that pond. And so when I would go out there, I would go out to the pond when it was getting frozen, and I'd wonder, is it strong enough yet? So first of all, I just heard it creep out on the ice. Get up for your edge. Go a little bit further. Listen carefully. Are there going to be any cracks that I hear? Go a little bit further. And if it felt really solid, maybe I'd do this a little bit. And if it felt really solid, then I'd walk around. And once I was sure that ice was really solid and safe, then I'd go and I'd put on my ice skates, and I'd ice skate on the pond. Now, what was I doing? I was testing out the ice till I knew that it was strong enough to put my weight on it. You know what I wasn't doing? I wasn't standing on the bank looking at it and saying, I wonder if my faith in the ice is good enough. That would have accomplished absolutely nothing. And so when it comes to our relationship with God, all you need is enough faith, imperfect as it is, to entrust yourself to Jesus Christ. You say, here's a chair, it looks a, a little frail. Is it strong enough to hold me up? That's a good question for a guy my size, because I've sat on chairs that haven't. And it hasn't been pretty. But how about this one? How about this stool? Do I trust it? Well, I may still have doubts. I mean, this might not be a solid stool. And the sermon illustration might just collapse right underneath me. But I slowly get on it. And now I can relax. If you got enough faith in Jesus to give your life to him and place your life in his hands, where you say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins of the past. I want to turn away from that past life. Get off the throne where I'm sort of sitting on my own throne and place myself in your hands and put my trust in you as my Savior and Lord. You do that, and your faith might be a little weak. You might have doubts through the years. But if it's strong enough to put yourself in the hands of Jesus, that's all you need. Because Jesus is always strong enough to hold you up. Make sense? All right. Let's go a little bit further. Jesus came into this world for one big reason. And that was so that people could be saved. He offers you this gift of salvation. It is a gift of life. Abundant life and eternal life. And when he says, I give you life that will never end, he means it. Unconditional. God is the one that does that work in your life. And so I urge you to accept this gift, to accept Christ, to put your faith in him. And you can do that by calling out to him in prayer and acknowledging Him as the Lord and Savior of your life. In your own words, you're going to want to just talk to God and say, you know, I've wronged you. I know it's my sin that separated me from you, so forgive me for all of that. I want to turn from that. I want to turn to you and trust you with my life. I acknowledge you as my Savior and Lord. And if you do that, you pass the first test. You trust in Jesus. But now comes the second test, and that is, do you live like Jesus? Now, this doesn't make you a Christian. This shows that you're a Christian. You see, if you truly put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, a miracle happens within you. You are transformed on the inside. You become his child. He turns you like from a Butter, from a caterpillar into a butterfly, you come alive spiritually. You've got a relationship with God. He now gives you his strength, his presence, his goodness, his guidance. He does all this work in your life, and he's doing a work in you to make you more and more and more like him. And so the Bible makes it very clear in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that we're saved totally by faith, not by works, but we are saved to works. That is, when you are truly saved, God does this transformation in your life where suddenly you are changed and, and you want to please Jesus. 
you want to follow him. Oh, you're always going to backslide. You're always going to blow it. But that's going to be the heart's desire is you want to live for God. God transforms your inner self and lives within you through his Holy Spirit. And you gain a desire and an ability to slowly grow more and more like him. Now, you're going to be a baby Christian. You're going to stumble and fall a lot. And even when you're big, you're going to still have those times when you struggle and fall. First John makes it very clear that none of us can come to God and say, I've got no sin. He says the person who does that in the end of 1 John chapter 1, who says he has no sin, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Because we are going to continue to blow it until the day that Jesus Christ returns. We're growing to be like him. And this process theologians call sanctification will be completed when he returns. But there's still going to be that growth process. It might be up and down a little bit, but it's going to be going up. First John chapter 2.29 says that if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Righteousness, acting rightly. And so if you are born of him, it's going to change your behavior. It's going to change your mindset. And yes, Jesus said, by your fruit, by their fruit you shall know them. And that's the same thing in your life. So if there's no fruit whatsoever, you're not connected to the vine. If you are connected to the vine, John chapter 15, there will be more fruit. Uh, Sometimes God's going to have to do some pruning in your life so there's even more, but there's going to be fruit. If there's no fruit whatsoever, then you know that there's no real connection with Jesus Christ. The Williams translation of chapter 3, verse 9 says, no one who is born of God makes a practice of sinning. He's saying that because it's in, it, the, the tense in the Greek doesn't mean he never sins. He doesn't make a practice of sinning. Uh, no one born of God deliberately and knowingly habitually practices sin, says in the Amplified Version. Chapter 5, verse 18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to habitually sin. So a true believer is going to be acting more and more like Jesus Christ, more and more righteous. They're going to be walking more and more in the light. And that's one of those tests. The other one is love, according to 1 John. If you know Jesus Christ, you're going to be walking more and more like Jesus. That means you're going to be walking more in the light. You're going to be walking more in love. You're going to find yourself loving God more. You're going to find yourself loving others more. Uh, Jesus said this, By your fruit you shall recognize them in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. And here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, it says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not... Love remains in death. So a true believer is characterized by light and love. That helps us understand some things. You're an eight-year-old child. Or let's turn around. Let's make it really hard on us. Your child is eight years old. He's in a Sunday school class. And he prays the sinner's prayer. But after that, you don't see any fruit in his life. Now, now an adult doesn't go to church, doesn't read his Bible, has no interest in things of God. You say, but he he prayed that prayer. You got to make sure that that prayer isn't treated like uh, open sesame. It's not a formula. Now, the Bible in the parable of the soils or the sower talks about the different kind of faith that we can have. And if you are genuine and authentic in praying that prayer, You are asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Master of your life. And now you are choosing to walk in that direction. If you are not growing, and there's not an increase in love, not an increase in light, then then I'd have to say, you know something? Maybe you misunderstood when you prayed that prayer. Maybe you weren't authentic. Maybe you weren't real. Maybe you were just treating it like a Hail Mary prayer. You need to ask yourself, did you make Jesus the master of your life? If so, follow him. Uh, Did you ask him to come into your life and make a difference? Are are you walking with him? Are you wanting to please him? 
You say, but Ron, I, I blow it all the time. Does it bother you that it blows you, that you blow it? Uh, are you frustrated that you're letting God down? See, that's the Holy Spirit in your life saying, you're messing on up. But if you don't care, that's a big fear. That's a big red sign that says, there's something wrong. You're hardened towards God. So yeah, you're going to have lots of times when you blow it and you mess on up. That's not proof that you're not a Christian. Every single Christian is going to blow it. But, but how do you respond to that? You respond with regret and remorse and repentance. And God, the Heavenly Father, picks you up like that little toddler, puts you back on your feet, dusts you on off, and it gives you another walking lesson until you fall again. He does it over and over again. And He constantly forgives you. Jesus says you need to forgive other people 70 times 7. And God's going to be that number because He's the God of grace. But if, if there's no fruit in this, then I would say, yeah, you better go back and look at your salvation. And so, first of all, you need to put your heart to the test. Did you believe in Jesus? And now are you striving to live for Him? And is that being shown in your life? So grade yourself on those two things. Test number one, did you believe in Jesus? Test number two, do you live like Jesus? You say, I still blow it. John Newton said this, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not what I hope to be in another world. But still I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. I love. Because, man, I get so disappointed in my spiritual life sometimes. But I do look back. And I do see growth. I do look back and enjoy all the sweet times I've had with God. I can see His work in my life and through my life. Oh, it's not what it ought to be. It's not what it will be. But by the grace of God, it's evident that He, as a kind Father, has been helping me along. Aren't you finding that in your life too? So go ahead and now say, okay, I passed the test. On that basis, you can say, I'm a genuine Christian. But I still have doubts. They still plague me, Ron. Okay, let's move to that next phase. And that is put your hearts at rest. Okay? And, uh, and so you got some doubts. You need, first of all, just sort of want to figure out where are they coming from? And uh, these doubts can come from different things. It, it, could, be, it could be somewhat uh, physical, for example. Uh, let's say that you've got a chemical imbalance. Or maybe something like hypoglycemia or electric light dis disturbances or fatigue or, or many other things that cause depression. And so as a result, you feel like you've got this big wet blanket on you and you just don't feel the joy of the Lord and that makes you doubt his presence, doubt his reality in your life. When maybe there's something physical in you that is causing some of that darkness. We want to make these big divisions between our physical and our spiritual, but, but really holistically God puts us together. And some of you are just born cocker spaniels and you're always up and going and bouncing around and always happy and others of you you know, you might just be a little more melancholy by the type of body and, that you've got. And that might be something you've got to surrender to the Lord and say, God, I struggle a little bit more with this perpetual, you know, grin and gun type of mentality. And so God might have to help you with that. That's not proof that you're not a Christian. And so deal with those physical causes. Maybe go to a doctor. Some of you might need to take some medicine. Uh, there's, there's psychological causes. Uh, if you grew up in a dysfunctional family, for example, where it just felt like you never had the approval of your father, you're going to have a hard time spiritually really believing in a heavenly father who absolutely adores you, who's always affirming you. You get through this mental image of a father and, and now you're overlaying God, putting it next to that picture and you're acting like this earthly father is just like your heavenly father. It's going to make it hard. And so you need to wrestle through that. And that's just one example of a psychological cause. Uh, your cause could also be theological. 
there are many that don't believe that we've got eternal life. And so if you've gone to that type of church, you know, you're always wondering, did I lose my salvation this week? And do I need to be saved again? And, and you need to just go back and study Scripture and see how, no, not only did you choose God, but before, and all involved with that, God chose you. And He says, you are mine forever. And you can rest in that assurance. But there might also be a spiritual cause. First John chapter 1 talks about unconfessed sin. He says, when we've got unconfessed sin in our life, it takes us out of fellowship with God. And when you're out of fellowship with God, God's going to seem far off because He is relationally. Not in His essence, because you are connected with Him forever. But on a fellowship level, you're walking one way, He's walking the other way, and it seems like He's not around. Well, guess who moved? Not Him. You did. And when you're not in fellowship with God, you're not going to feel the joy of His presence, and that's going to cause you to have some doubts. It could also be Satan himself. How's he described? As the accuser of the brother. So he's constantly whispering in your ear, you're not really a Christian. No, not you. Look at what you've done. Look at what you've thought. Look at how, how you blew it in this situation. He's going to be accusing you all of the time. He's the deceiver. And so you got these different spiritual causes that you want to deal with. If it's false accusations by way of Satan, you need to say, I resist that. I submit myself to God. I draw near to Him and I resist the devil and He will flee from me. John, James chapter 4. If it's I confess it, ask God, Lord, is there anything in my life that's not pure and right? Ask Him to forgive you for that and, and enjoy that fellowship with Him. So how do you conquer these, these false doubts? We'll start by removing anything that might be physical or anything that might be psychological. You might do that through, through medicine or through a doctor. Or you might do it through a counselor. Uh, but definitely look at the spiritual Make sure that you're walking in fellowship with him and you're confessing your sins and you're claiming his promises and not listening to the accuser. Uh, you see, the biggest problem is always misplaced faith. You're not putting your faith in God's promises. You're putting your faith in your feelings or in Satan's accusations. And so you've got to learn how to take your faith and aim it towards God and His promises. And constantly keep yourself from placing it on something faulty. Now here are some of the greatest verses that will ever help you in this. If you don't have your Bibles open, you might want to look at this and underline these really, really good. And that's 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. These are the key verses that gave me peace and made a humongous difference in my life. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in His presence whenever our hearts condemn us. Now, get this. He's talking to Christians, and He's giving the bold, honest truth that sometimes our hearts condemn us. It's our very feelings that point at us and, and give us that spirit of condemnation. You're not really a Christian. You know, you're, 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 you're bad. You're, you know, how can God have anything to do with you? On and on and on and on. Our hearts condemn us. And he says, what can you do to set your heart at rest whenever that happens? How can you know that you belong to the truth? Look at it again. This is how we know that we belong to the truth. How we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and He knows everything. Who is greater, your heart or God? Who is greater, the faith you have in God? Or those feelings that say, I'm not really a Christian. You see, that's what you do, is, is you come and whenever you have those doubts, you aim your faith at God has promises and you say, I'm not going to listen to my feelings because they are so flippant. If I wake up on the bad side of the bed, I'm grumpy today. God is always consistent. He's always true. He always knows. So I'm going to put my trust in Him and His promises. Do I know everything? Absolutely not. According to this verse, does God know everything? 
Absolutely true. So where am I going to put my faith? Doesn't it make sense that you put your faith in God? And so it's, it's like ammunition where, where you get these different scripture verses and you put them like, like, like bullets in your gun and whenever you got those false doubts, you just shoot them down. Boom, 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 boom. And so you'll, you'll want to go and look at all the promises in Scripture and all the assurances. And you say, you know, he promised that if I call upon him in faith, I will be saved. Is that true or not? God says it's true. I'm going to believe in him. My feelings say I'm not sure. Why would I put my faith in my feelings? I'm going to trust in him. And so your faith should be placed in God's facts. And the feeling should follow. It's like a train. And it's fact, that's the engine. Faith, that's the call car. Caboose is feelings. If you switch the caboose to the front, your train isn't going anywhere. But if you take the faith that you've got that's in the call car and you put it in the train, it's going to keep going forward. And then just let the feelings follow. Don't make that the, 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 the main engine. So here are some verses that will help you. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. All right? So there's a genuine choice on their part to follow God. But it, there's also a choice on his part. It says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Did you underline that word Never. Never, ever, ever. They shall never perish. Why? Because no one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. God the Father chose you, placed you in His hand, gave you as a gift to the Son, and He says, and no one can snatch you out of that hand. Satan can't do that. The world can't do that. Other problems can't do that. You can't do that. God is greater than all. His strength is greater than all. God has said, Hebrews 13, 15, never, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Never, ever, ever. That's a promise. Going through those doubts, just take that and repeat it over and over and over again. Take that verse, shoot down the doubts. 1 John 5, 12 through 13. What? Clinton read to us before. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. All right. Let me tell you a story. A story about me and my sister. Let me be honest with you. In most of my stories... I don't look very good. And that's true with this one too. My sister, Becky, she's been here seven years younger than me. You're not going to believe this of me, but I, I used to tease my sister. I did. One day I told her she wasn't really a shoveling. No. So look at yourself. Do you look like the rest of us? No. No. Mom and dad found you on the side of the road. And we, we adopted you, and it's wonderful. We're glad you're in the family, but you're, you're not really a shovel. And she, full of defiance, says, that's not right. That's not true. I don't believe you. Yeah, think about it. Yeah, look at yourself in the mirror. Yeah, you're not really a shovel. That's not right. I don't believe you at all, she says. Mm. But I knew I'd gotten in her head. And so she sort of nonchalantly got her nose in the air, not paying any attention to me. And you know, she just sort of walks towards the hallway. And she walks down the hallway and she goes to the, uh, to the room where my mom is in there working on the laundry. And she shuts that door behind her so it's just her and mom. And where was I? Well, I snuck on down to listen to the conversation. And once she got inside there, all of her bravado was gone. And she Ross said, I'm not really a shoveling. You, you, you just found me on, on, the, on the side of the road, and I'm, I'm, I'm not really one. 
My mom says, honey, you got to stop listening to Ron. <laughs> You're really a chaplain. I remember that wonderful day in the hospital when you were born and your dad was there and oh you you are you don't listen to him and uh she came out of that room all huffy and puffy and says i asked mom and she said i'm really a shovelin now at that moment she had a choice to make is she going to listen to mom who never deceived her or is she going to listen to me You've got a choice to make. Who are you going to listen to? Who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the accuser? That Ron guy? <laughs> Your feelings? Satan? All those doubts? Are you going to listen to God? That's the choice that you want to make. Take your faith, put in the facts, and when you trust God, then the good feelings will come then you'll experience the joy and assurance he wants you to get there. So that's how you destroy your doubts and receive the assurance that you have become a child of God. You know, I met with Ron Howard, <laughs> and, and I shared this with him, and I said, if you're not sure, Ron, just nail it down today. Just nail it down and never mess with it again. Just, just pray today. And I led him in prayer. He says, dear Jesus, honestly, I have doubts whether or not I'm a Christian. Just be honest with God. So he, he prays that. But, but I do confess my sins. And I turn to you as my Savior and Lord, and I give my life to you. And I count on your promise that do is doing that, that you will give me salvation, eternal life. Adopt me as your child. He prayed that. And he says, now from now on, you don't need to pray that again. You don't need to pray that every time there's some, some uh, salvation message given in church. You don't need to pray that at night when you're, when you're alone and feeling, feeling concerned. Just go back and say, wait a minute. I nailed that down when I accepted God's promise and he said it. I believe it. And that settles it. And just go back to that. And feel the peace. Just keep going back and placing your faith in God's facts. And who He is and what He says. And then let the peace come. That's what I urge you to do. Now, this sermon is not a new one. In fact, it's one of the chapters of this book. Uh, and if, if you want to, to, to read it again, you're having some doubts, you want to wrestle through it, go ahead and grab this. I see I've only got two left up here, but I've got more in my office, and so if they're gone, go ahead and grab it then. But just nail it down and feel the sweet peace. You know, Christians are going to go to heaven in two ways. Some are going to go enjoying the journey and always feeling peace, and others are going to go full of anxiety and always feeling worry. Which way do you want to go? I'd say enjoy the journey, guys. The destination is phenomenal, but the sights along the way are awfully sweet, too. All right? Okay, I think my time is done. Worship team, would you please come on up and close us out in worship? And if any of us can be of assistance to you, you want, you want something to pray with afterwards, or you got further questions, boy, feel free to talk to me or one of the other leaders around, and we would we'd love to do that with you.